fight we see here, this what's happening here on the ground and standing in Rock Sioux Nation, it's, it, it's something special and particular to what's happening here. It, it, it matters to fight this pipeline, to the communities here, to the people here. But it also matters because it connects to the greater struggle for us to protect Mother Earth and to protect our future generations from destructive climate change. Uh, we're ceremonial people and we protect uh, this sacred land here. And our ancestors are buried here. And uh, they recognize uh, cemeteries as a sacred site. So today, you know, they're it's totally, I don't even, not even, there's not even no words for what they have done to us. You know? So sad because they, to us, it, 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 it hurts our spirit. But like the elders said that, my heart is hurting, what they have done to you plow over our ancestors. The hurt that happened to the, the graves and to pray and to say, we're sorry that we let this happen. We're, we're sorry that we allowed this to happen. Forgive us. We come to you in a good way. And we're gonna pray and we're gonna vow that it's not gonna happen again by us putting our own bodies physically on the line. And so we'll physically stand in front of a bulldozer, we'll physically lock down to something to make sure that this never happens again. And then we left offerings, you know, prayer ties and tobacco. And we left our prayers in that way to try and heal some of the hurt for both the, the ones that were disturbed by the digging and for those of us that felt all of the pain from that. So we wanted to continue that narrative around how we're just sacred defenders, we're protectors. We're not protesters. We're out here doing what anybody would do if somebody came into their backyard and started digging up the bones of their grandparents. The next day we went and we had a walk and a march and a prayer and we walked with prayer, we walked with medicines, we walked with a banner that said defend the sacred. You know our struggle, this, this, this resistance that you see here, it's not, it's, it's not a resistance born out of hate or negativity, it's a resistance born out of love, love for each other, love for this land. And that's the ask that we have for our relatives out there, our non-native relatives is you know, re reconnect, renew your relationship to Mother Earth. Redefine how we relate to each other based off of our original instructions. You know, we've been here, we know how to take care of the land. Just listen to us. And they mean woman who stands by the water, <clears throat> woman who loves the water. And that has been my life struggle. My name's Cody Hall. I am uh, half Mini Koju from Shine River and half Kung Papa from Standing Rock. So, yat a she a Michelle Cook Minishie, Hanagat Minishli, Bilagana Buses Chain, Kobahi Dash A, Bilagana Dashinelli. My name is Michelle Cook. I'm from the Dine Nation, and my clan is the one who walks around you clan. My name is uh, Terrell Ironshaw. Um, I'm Oglala Lakota and Eastern Band Cherokee. Um, I have been here in uh, Cannonball for over a month now. This community represents and is symbolic of a peaceful and prayerful community that um, is a human being um, effort. When we got to the numbers of 7,000, we 
we could no longer call this a camp, although it is historic, um, historically, uh, Ochenti Shakoi. It's, um, it is a camp by those means, um, but it's all, it now has become um, a community. And so we've, we have a school, um, we have a marketplace, and we're in a free zone where there is, this is not um, North Dakota and this is not um, the tribe. So it's, it's uh, the land itself is owned by about 40,000 uh, landowners who are Ocheti Shakoi. Ocheti Shakoi predates um, the U.S. Constitution and as such, um, Ocheti Shakoi are the predecessor sovereign uh, from Dakota territory. Dakota meaning um, our people, that's our traditional name and it means friend or ally. And um, you put W-O in front of it, you have Wo Dakota, which, and Wo Lakota, Wo Nakota is peace. I lived on the Missouri as a child. I drank the water from the Missouri. We lived uh, in the riverbed and we had gardens, self-sustenance, um, and then the government built dams and they destroyed 55,000 acres of land on Standing Rock. We had the most pristine um, land and we also had the largest forest of any um, Indian nation in, uh, on the river of the 28 nations on the river. So um, no welfare, no conditions of colonialism forced on us. Um, so that's my life and who I am. Um, water has been my life struggle because they removed us when I was 10 years old and then the conditions of colonialism began. The community we have here today, it represents a new way of thinking, a rebirth and a revolution um, that is mandated by human nature. Indigenous people, shine your light, we are equal. I remember the days when our prayers were illegal. I remember the days when being Indian was lethal. Yeah, we had a rough past, but get ready for the sequel, yeah. Get ready for the glorious comeback of our people, oh, yeah. Rise up, all you warriors of love. All you answers to the prayers of our ancestors from above. I can feel it in my heart. Can you feel it in your blood? I can hear the seven fire calling us to wake up. All nations rise. Rise up, cause now's your time. We don't have to hide anymore, cause now's our time. Through the nonviolent direct action, it poses a bump on the road for this construction company to achieve their ultimate goal, which is trying to finish this project. As long as we are interrupting that, it puts a strain on the company to finish this project on a deadline. The deadline is set for, I believe, January, or January 3rd of 2017. And the more and more days that, that get pushed back, those are days they can't get back and they have to try to find a way to make up through the people's actions of how they lock themselves on machinery, just causing a, a disturbance, but in a good way, so that this project doesn't get built is, uh, is the most effective way that the camp has been doing, I mean, really for, for a long time. A lot of the, the people that are doing this, they've done uh, other actions across the country. So this isn't their first rodeo being here in North Dakota. As I was pulled over, uh, one cop car was uh, obviously behind me with the lights. And then as they got me out of the vehicle, there were four other vehicles that, that, that pulled up behind that. And as they cuffed me and, and, and put me in the back seat, um, I overheard the rest of the, the police officers that were standing out to show a presence uh, 
when I heard a few of them say, who do we have? And uh, the response was, we have Cody Hall. And they started cheering. And, uh, and I thought, wow, okay, you know, like they made me out to be somebody who I'm not, you know, this violent person and, you know, that antagonizes or whatever. Uh, that villain, once I was brought into Morton County Jail, as the elevator door opens, and when I came out, uh, I was greeted with like eight state officers in their vests, you know, looking like what you see in those videos or in those pictures early on um, when this campaign started, when this protest campaign started, you know. And I thought, wow, that's really overkill, you know. One person, and you're, ma you're meeting eight of these officers plus the correctional officers inside. They want to do fear-mongering techniques. They want to, they want to speak bad about call, not calling them protectors, calling them protesters, um, using all these, these, these negative isms on, you know, on, on people that are uh, peaceful. We're unarmed, but yet we're met with SWAT gear police officers. Um, like, like it's a, like, you know, they're, they're ready for battle. But the real battle is through the power of words and the power of the mind. And they are not armed that way. They're armed with, with guns and the look of, of intimidation. But when you start speaking to them from your heart, telling them, you know, why we're doing this, you can see the look in these officers' eyes of a change because it's not about them personally trying to attack them. It's about the protection of future generations, of, of how we have to you know, view things on a, on, a, on a broader scale, of not just seeing protectors on one end and then you see armed guards on the other. There's a huge story right in the middle right there. I have been here um, to facilitate the legal team. Today is my one month anniversary here at Standing Rock, camped in the Ocheti Shakwi camp. Um, we have a lot of elders here, we have a lot of women and children, and um, so we have been very much concerned in, in doing what we can to place those who are most vulnerable in the center of our decision making and in the, in the center of our, our overall legal strategy. When we talk about rights in the United States, when we talk about human rights in the United States, we often do that from a distance. Um, however, when you come to a place like this and you see um, our constitutional rights be violated, when you see the civil and political rights be violated, when you experience and see human rights be violated, it changes your perspective on where we are as a country, where we are as indigenous peoples in the United States. We consistently see that when indigenous peoples have exercised their, their human right to self-determination, their inherent right to self-determination, um, they have been met with incredible acts of violence. Indigenous peoples have a right to their lands, territories, and natural resources. They have a right to their sui generis legal systems and their self-governance. They have a right of self-determination and by virtue of that right to pursue their economic, social, cultural development. That is, that is a right, um, that is a human inherent right and that is what this camp is about. After the injunction was denied in D.C., the intervention by the Department of Justice, the um, Department of Interior, and the Department of Defense um, stated two recommendations in the intervention, and one was to reconsider the consultation and con consultation policies in the United States, and the other was uh, uh, proposed legislation that would change the statutory framework of the United States. And so if they are truly in good faith with those recommendations, then we certainly have um, a conversation and we certainly have much to tell them in how we would like to see that statutory framework of federal Indian law be changed to align with indigenous people's human rights. <laughs> I just uh, joined the International Indigenous Youth Council, um, you know, as something to do. And now it's grown into um, this whole 
like a almost like a, its own you know small movement here. Yeah, yeah. We were asked by the elders to to lead this demonstration today, and so we 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 just hit, we hit the ground running. Where we have the youth, and we, we you know we're educating them on you know our treaty rights and just our you know human rights, and um, we're really just trying to empower them, and not only youth my age, but you know the kids. And we really want, you know, we really want them to know that they do have a voice, and you know, they are the ones that are that are going to do this for us. Social media has has played a major role in this, whereas, uh, you know, we have all of these allies that that can't be here, but they stand in solidarity with us. Um, we're receiving an almost, I, wouldn't, I don't want to say overwhelming, but it's, you know, it's, it's, you know, we get a lot of mail. Uh, from supporters, you know, saying that they stand with us and they're they're standing in solidarity with us, and so we're trying to uh, get these different messages or symbols uh, to to try to connect with them where where they could stand with us and they can do actions with us, but just directly from home or wherever they are. Everything is possible. Hey, stop in the pipeline. Stop in the pipeline. Possible. When you come to camp and you actually walk around and the, you know everyone's in unity and peace and prayer, you know everywhere you go, I you know I'm Oglala Lakota and one of my best friends, one of my brothers, he's Pawnee and he lives, he camps right across the road from us, and you know back in back in the old days that wouldn't have never have happened, we would never have been able to get that chance to to get to know one another on on that personal level, and. You know, there there are a lot of different tribes here, and uh, some some of them, you know, they haven't been this close in contact with each other in hundreds of years. This is really a great time for our people, where where we're all coming together and we're all standing for one thing, and it's not just for this pipeline. You know, now we have all of these different networks and relations that we can we can call upon, and we can all stand in solidarity with each other, and it can it can go farther than this pipeline. And that's really what we're trying to do here is gear these young kids up for the future. This is just a small stepping stone for them where they're going to learn these, these leadership roles and, and the roles that they play in our culture and our heritage and the different protocols that they have to follow. They're going to learn that here. So when they're older and we have more things like this and more opportunities for our people to network and you know, build our voices, then they will already have those, those common tools. Yesterday, we had us youth, we led a rally in, in Bismarck. I'm very happy and humbled to see all of you people here supporting us. All of you people that are here supporting the youth. The youth are the ones that are leading this movement. The youth are the ones that have the voice. We're the ones who have the power. We're the ones who are going to stop this black snake. When we came back, there was a, a they're almost like a, like a warrior society in their own way, but it was—it's a group of elderly women, and um, they, when we had came back from from the meet, from the rally, they they had heard about it, and so they invited us over to the Red Warrior Camp, and they had a meeting with us, and they had voiced their support for us, and also their their concerns for for uh, the youth. Uh, not only here, but for uh, all of the youth, all of our all of our people's youth, and uh, the struggles that we're having. But they had said that we had given them hope for for our generation because of the things that we're doing and the leadership roles that we have taken. You know, we're really setting a new path for for these young people to follow. We're not going to allow a government or a corporation to ignore the suffering of these people. We're not going to allow a corporation to come and possibly decimate the Lakota Dakota people. We're not going to allow it. And so you see that the world, the whole world, has rallied to support this movement, this pure movement of, of humble and beautiful people who, have, who are doing nothing more than demanding that they will exist, that they will live, that they will have dignity that they will not be silent as their cultures, as their peoples, as their water is threatened and undermined by corporate greed or corporate entities. And that's who we are as a people. We are the voice of the earth. We are the voice of the water.
and we're asking for the forces that be to stop the destruction and to let us live. I, I want to see people down the road living and not developing cancers, not developing incurable diseases. I want to, I want to see as I'm older when the young generation say, where were you in that fight? What did you contribute? Because that right there, history will tell the real truth. We're all coming from, from harsh environments when we come from home. Um, you know, we come from reservations where, you know, there's, there's violence and there's drugs and, you know, there's, there's all of these things there and all of this things, dysfunction. And when we come here, we're bringing it all with us. You know, we can't really leave it at home. It's a part of who we are. But being here is also like a healing ceremony where we're all here and we're learning each other's struggles and we're learning each other's stories. But we're able to heal each other from that and, you know, really reflect on ourselves through our, like, like um, really reflecting on ourselves like through someone else's eyes, you know, you know, seeing someone's story and, and hearing the things that they've gone through and just realizing that, you know, we have a lot in common with each other, even though we come from these different places and these different nations, all of this stuff, this dysfunction is still there and it, it's a part of being an oppressed person, being in, a, in an oppressive, in, impressive, oppressive environment where we still face a lot of systemic racism and um, uh, genocide. We have a collective memory of trauma and that drives us. We have the collective memory of survival and we've been given these um, spiritual, uh, these deep spiritual connections with our ancestors and we believe in the cycle of um, the children are sacred um, that's what Wakaija means, sacred being, and we have to treat our children as that, take that back and raise our children in that way with our language and our culture. What I see here is within these youth is the, they yearn for this knowledge, you know, of our ancestors and of our treaties and these relationships that our nations have with the with the government, you know, the United States, and, um, you know, and how those relationships really affect our lives and the way we grow up and, you know, even the way uh, we get old. I have a three-year-old daughter and she's here with me and I take her to all of these meetings with me and she sees all of the different ceremonies go on, not only the ceremonies of our people, but ceremonies of other people all across Turtle Island, all across this whole world. And, you know, she's, she's learning, she's absorbing all of this. And so when she gets older, she's gonna say, yeah, I was there, you know, during the biggest gathering of nations on the planet. I was here and I learned from these people. I had relationships with these people. And those are relationships that are gonna last a lifetime. This is a rebirth for Ocheti Shakoi. It's um, higher than the Constitution of the United States. It's cultural and no one can defy natural law, no one. And natural law is um, being tampered with, with climate change. So we interpret that, the spirituality that is necessary to not completely we can never go back because mother earth is tilting and we can never set her back up and we may have only a, a certain time we may have a millennia left but um, it's a continuing um, motion that we have to do as human beings to try to preserve what time there is left for human survival Water's life! Granny Tony, water's life!